All right, hello guys, how's it going? In today's video, we're gonna be updating you guys on the Winter Thoughts series. We're gonna be going over the current sea surface temperatures, any updated model guidance, which there's a lot of it, by the way. We're gonna be going over all of those things in just a moment. Anyways, before I get into things, be sure to smash that like button, leave a comment down below, and subscribe for more weather-related content. For today's comment of the day, I would like to know, when do you think the winter is going to fully set in? You know, sometimes it's late, sometimes it's early, sometimes it's on time. When do you think it's going to be when we really get into a winter pattern? Let me know in the comments down below, and I'll be picking one of those for tomorrow's video. Let's get straight into this video, and first things first, I want to touch on something that I really haven't done in any of these winter thoughts videos. And here we are taking a look at our 60-day two meter temperature anomaly. So this is the past 60 days, uh, but that's as of October 31st because I wanted to encompass the entire months of September and October in here. And we've been in a positive AO. You can see it's been very warm in the Eastern United States and people think that generally means that the winter uh, is not going to be too cold. But as you can see for portions of Eastern Russia, portions of Alaska, portions of Greenland, there's been very cold temperatures compared to normal over the months of September and October. What this does is it encourages more ice to develop, obviously, with the colder temperatures than normal, and it also encourages more snowfall than normal, building up that snowpack. So in general, there's more ice in the northern regions. Okay, and what this does is it influences the colder air above it to become even colder with that ice below it. Uh, so this is a basically a polar vortex that is strengthening. And what this does is once it goes ahead and, and it weakens, it would lead towards even colder than normal conditions. So let's take a look at that ice and that snow, by the way. And as you can see, there's plenty of ice uh, over the Arctic regions and plenty of snow for Canada, Alaska, Greenland, and especially Russia there, as you can see, uh, where there's a very, very dramatic amount of snowfall that has taken place uh, just recently, actually, over the past weeks and as you can see, now we're taking a look at those sea surface temperatures. That stuff is very important, but also these sea surface temperatures are very important as well. We have developed into a nice La Nina, uh, so we can see a lot more blue there than the last time I updated you guys. We also see that waters offshore of Canada there in the Pacific and south of Alaska are also colder than normal as well. The Atlantic overall is warmer than normal. Uh, but as we zoom in, the important thing here is that the waters near the coast are colder and the water south of Greenland is actually warmer. This is two areas that are the most important. One, the coast being colder than normal is important because as cold air moves into your regions, it allows for the coastal areas to get a little bit colder than they would if you had above normal waters. Uh, so for the southeast coast and the Gulf Coast, that air is going to be able to influence your temperatures more because if you had warmer than normal waters, that water temperature actually influences the air temperature around it, and that would actually therefore influence your air temperature. But with the below normal sea surface temperatures, that means you can get a little bit colder than typical there along the coast. Uh, those warm waters south of Greenland encourage a high pressure system or a ridge to set up in that region, which encourages a, or sorry, a trough to set up in the eastern United States oftentimes. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to move on and we're going to take a look at the change. We're going to take a look at the seven-day change uh, globally and then for the Atlantic as well, see how things have been moving. Then we're going to get into some charts and some model guidance where things are looking a lot more wintry uh, than originally anticipated. All right, now here is that seven-day change globally. As you can see, actually, for our ENSO region where there's a lot of red there in the middle of the Pacific uh, that is actually an ENSO or La Nina that is weakening quite a bit. We'll see that on the chart a little bit later on. Uh, but let's zoom into the Atlantic here because I wanted to point out that the coastal regions are cooling significantly. This is mostly due to that cold air that is set up over these regions. That is cooling the waters below it. So yes, the sea surface temperatures influence the air temperature, but the air temperature also influences the water temperatures. Uh, so it goes hand and hand. Uh, but we can see that south of Greenland, those waters have generally been warming, especially there near uh, Newfoundland and Nova Scotia as well, just offshore. Uh, we do have some red patches. Now here is our Nino 3.4 index, or basically how we measure our El Nino or La Nina. And as you can see, things had been cooling progressively very nicely as we headed into early November uh, to where we were approaching moderate La Nina status below negative uh, 1.0. But really, we've rebounded since then. 
uh, back up to where we're more in a weak La Nina territory. And we don't know at this point how much this is going to warm or if when it's going to turn around and cool again. Uh, it really is a big question mark at this point. Now, as we take a look at the North Atlantic, it stayed pretty consistently warm overall. Now, let's get into that model guidance because I know a lot of you are probably excited for this. I'm going to show you guys the rest of November here on our CFS monthly model as well. No surprise here, it looks colder in the east. We do anticipate that. We've been talking about that for a while now here on this channel. Warm in the west, so a positive PNA that allows for that trough to really set in in the east. And we might even get that polar vortex that we talked about earlier that was strengthening to weaken a bit, which allows for that cold air to escape that region and head elsewhere. And when you have that positive PNA, the warm temperatures out west, the cold air can't go there, so it shifts to the east. Uh, and it goes over the east instead, and that's exactly what we're seeing here. Uh, now let's take a look at December. Things change a little bit. We see that warm in the west still, the cold in the east, but we do have a bit of a southeast ridge uh, and a ridge over the Gulf states as well with some warmer temperatures, but you can tell for the most part the cold is centered over the central United States and a bit of the eastern United States for December as well. I think everybody would be happy about that, cold and snow lovers that is. Now, January seems to be the coldest month of the winter, according to our CFS monthly model. As you can see, cold is centered over the east. Uh, we have temperatures that are about 2 to 4 degrees below normal generally for most of the eastern and central United States. We also have some cold air set up over the western United States as well, especially Washington there, where we have temperatures that are 4 to 8 degrees below normal. Very, very interesting and definitely on par with our winter forecast. And then for February, it's still cold, but just not quite as cold as January was. Now in a moment what we're going to do is we're going to move on and we're going to take a look at the entire winter as a whole. December, January, and February combined to see what the overall winter looks like according to this model. All right now here we are taking a look at the DJF or the December, January, February temperature anomalies here according to the CFS model here and as you can see cold over the east a little bit of cold over the west coast with warmth over the four corner states and some of the Gulf states as well we do see that southeast ridge is present uh, but most of that warmth is actually centered over the southwestern United States you can tell the trough really wants to go into the eastern United States as a whole here uh, and as we take a look at the two meter temperature anomalies for the northern hemisphere it makes it very clear here uh, that we have that polar vortex strengthening, but this model is forecasting for over the course of the winter for it to weaken dramatically. We see warm air temperatures over the Arctic regions and the cold is shoving into Russia, shoving into Canada and shoving into the United States instead. The opposite of this would be very cold temperatures over the Arctic Circle and warm, basically donutting around that all the way around uh, because the cold can't escape it. So this is the perfect setup for a cold winter. You have a very warm fall where all that cold is centered over the Arctic regions, encouraging more ice growth, more snow growth, and generally colder conditions up there. And then it releases throughout your winter months. That is how you get the coldest of winters. Uh, it, you generally do not see a fall that is very cold in the United States and then backed by a winter that is cold in the United States because that polar vortex would not have strengthened in that case. Now here's the precipitation forecast and it also looks very similar to how my winter forecast has looked all the way since we started making them. Uh, a lot of precipitation up there in the northwest and then for the Ohio Valley as well and then mostly dry for the southwest, south central and southeastern United States. Again right on par with our forecast. And then last but not least here's the modeled guidance for our ENSO and as you can see it's expected to kind of hover around somewhere in between that negative 1.0 line and that negative 0.5 line. Uh, for quite a while until we reach the springtime and we basically approach, approach a La Ni or sorry, an El Nino by the time we're reaching the summer months of next year. It's a little bit long range and it could change, but generally this is pretty easy to predict very far out. So uh, I feel pretty confident that with two years in a row of a La Nina, we're probably going to be heading at least towards a neutral Enso, if not an El Nino, by the time we're reaching next summer and fall. Anyway, for our confidence tab, we're at a four out of six today. Uh, we're approaching the winter rapidly, and by the time we're reaching late November, I will feel extremely confident in our final winter forecast and our maybe our last winter thoughts videos if we do one more update. For today's comment of the day, I asked you guys, do you think November is going to go down as a colder or warmer month from this point forward? And Paul L. said, I feel like November will have a warm-up next week, which is going to happen, but after next week, 
is over, it will go back to a cold and prob probably snowy uh, pattern, I guess is what Paul L. is saying. Got a lot of likes here. I think a lot of you agreed with Paul L. And I generally do as well. It looks like that warm-up is going to be quite brief, lasting anywhere from about three to five days. And then after that is done, it looks like we will get into an even more potent cold pattern as the AO continues to trend downward. Uh, and we expect a positive PNA as well. This seems like a pretty solid pattern. For today's patron highlight of the day, I want to thank you all for supporting the channel, but especially our platinum patrons. Bill Crates, James Wade, Dovin Eagle, Little the Pan, Mandy Birchfield, and Patrick Strickland as well. I would also like to thank our diamond patrons, Bill Roberts, Marcus Connolly, Noah Harley, Michael Kudalesa, Catbite, Charles Dennett, Cindy Klein, Alan Goodmaben, Bill Dallas, Gary's, John Khaleesi, Dwight Valen, Stephen Krenthal, and Thomas D. Barr as well. I would also like to thank our channel members, Catbite, Stephen Fan, and Jeremy Cox as well. Anyway guys, thank you so much for watching this video. Be sure to smash that like button, leave a comment down below, and subscribe for more weather-related content. I will see you guys in the next video.